Hello, my name is Gerger Husti and welcome to this talk, um, which is about managed service mesh as a distributed cloud service. So, yep, my name is Gerger Husti. I work for IBM and I'm a dev uh, lead for a team uh, which is developing a service called Satellite Mesh, which mostly this talk will be about today. Um, yeah, Tong, over to you. Oh, thanks, Gergo. Uh, my name is Tong Lee, uh, a senior software engineer at IBM, and also a very new ISTO maintainer. Um, I have been doing uh, software architect uh, developer, deployer, operator, um, advocator, and a consultant uh, for many years for IBM. Uh, recently, I focus on cloud comp computing, uh, social software, and the blockchain technologies. Uh, in for the ISTU, I mainly focused on ISTU operator and the environment. Uh, very happy to uh, talk to you guys. Gergo. Okay, just a quick note. Um, if you have seen the previous presentation from Lucas and Rafa, I hope you guys don't mind if I took a screenshot of you already. Um, so Lucas's and, and Rafa's talk was about how IBM manages its own fleet of Kubernetes uh, clusters with Istio. Uh, while this talk will be how we offer the same Istio experience for our customers because it is driven by many uh, other use cases and, and requirements. So it is it is good to uh, good to clarify this before we jump in. Um, but then let's look at our agenda. So I would like to talk a bit about uh, how distributed clouds work, how you can imagine that, and most importantly, how Istio fits into this picture with its uh, split control plane or external control plane model. And most of the presentation will be about how it is possible to actually implement um, external control plane Istio into, into production in case of a, of a public cloud or distributed cloud uh, vendor. So we will talk about a lot of, uh, lot of interesting stuff, how, how you can split uh, things up between the provider and the users, um, let's say area. Um, Okay, so distributed clouds. Uh, many cloud provider, providers are going to, let's say, extend uh, their cloud offerings outside of their data center, um, actually. And then, so it's not anymore the someone else's computer, right? So you can you can you can run and consume uh, public cloud services in your data center or actually anywhere else. Um, and it is very important. This is what what about uh, IBM Cloud Satellite or Google Antos is about. Um, it is really you provide the infrastructure and the provider, so the cloud provider provides the service on top. Um, it is often impl implemented like some of your uh, workload will become part of the provider's infrastructure, and so you are not able. Uh, to let's say configure it or uh, or manage it anymore, and most of your your compute will be uh, actually your workload uh, still. For example, your Kubernetes nodes um, or other workloads. Um, okay, a principle in my opinion for any managed cloud service is that run as less management entity on the user side as possible, ideally zero. Um, now, what that means, actually, you should not, um, let's say, host anything which is not strictly required to run on the user's uh, workload or the user's hosts, um, because the user may pay for that. The user may pay for egress traffic or for CPU time or, or, or whatever, and the user obviously don't want to pay uh, for stuff which is which is relevant for the provider and not for, not for the customer itself. Um, on the other side, what the user uh, can see they probably want to tweak things up uh, or tune things, and they make they may even break your uh, your uh, workload if you are the provider. Um, so it is it is a, a good principle, I guess, uh, to keep keep the uh, control plane entities away from the users user managed parts of of the system. Um, 
Another important thing is that if the if the provider is running um, control plane entities on uh, on the provider side, they are more able to manage scale, upgrade, monitor everything um, uh, more easily than in the other way around. Um, okay, so with that, let's jump into Istio stuff. Um, so back in 2021, last year, our team was formed and Frank Budinski and Lin Sun at the time uh, told us that there is this thing called external control plane, which was very new um, to the Istio deployment models at the time. Uh, it became half, I guess, in, in 1.8. And so our task was to really implement this uh, in a production ready uh, way for, for IBM customers. Um, now, based on the comparison on the left-hand side, you can see the regular combined um, the regular combined setup uh, with STOD running in the mesh cluster, while on the right-hand side, it is, it is the split control play model where STOD is actually running somewhere else, uh, outside of the cluster where the user wants to have its workload. Um, okay. So it looks like it's about running STOD somewhere else. So you might wonder why this is a 40 minutes talk, but bear with us, uh, a lot of challenges ahead. Um, okay, mm, some basic mesh operation. I re, uh, redrawn this figure for better extensibility. So we have the control plane cluster, which is managed by the uh, cloud provider or the service provider. And we have the data plane cluster, which is the user's uh, side. And if you remember the principle, uh, we should not run anything on the data plane cluster uh, other than the actual uh, Envoy proxies, ideally. So that's why, for example, STOD is went over to the control plane cluster. Uh, I will use the same figure and extend it uh, throughout the presentation. So let's see the first change which we have to make to clarify things. Um, if you know how Envoy proxies are working, basically th they are gRPC clients to STOD, which means um, the arrows need to be flipped uh, towards STOD because really the uh, service proxies are connecting uh, on the TCP level to STOD, which is very important because they are running in the different in a, in a different cluster. Um, another important thing to add uh, is that we don't only have sidecar proxies uh, where Envoy uh, is used, but we also have ingress and egress gateways on the edge <clears throat> connected to the public network or the external network at least. And they are uh, built from the very same Envoy uh, proxies and so they are connecting uh, also to STOD for, for configuration. Um, okay, since these are two different clusters, we need to make sure that STOD is correctly exposed, right? Because as long as STOD is, is deployed in the same cluster, it is you know just a service, a pod or a few pods uh, in the Istio system namespace where everybody uh, can easily connect to. But as soon as it is deployed into a different cluster, uh, all kind of uh, challenges uh, comes up. So you need to make sure that you properly expose this STOD towards the data plane cluster, uh, potentially on the public network. So you need uh, some kind of ingress management and routing uh, stuff. Um, now, this is a tricky topic because um, the proxies need to be aware, for example, about the CA, uh, which is signing STODs um, certificate when it when it comes to uh, the <coughs> gRPC, the encrypted gRPC connection. Um, and in that case, uh, Envoy is aware only about the public certificates. I mean, the public CAs, which means you need a proper DNS management and proper certificate management uh, in this ingress point, because uh, so far the, the HTTPS termination is delegated to this uh, party here. 
So that's that's the first topic uh, to cover. And then when you correctly expose this TOD, it turns out this TOD needs to access the mesh cluster API, which is the data plane cluster in our case. Uh, it is needed for two things mainly. First of all, for the Istio configuration, so like the Istio.io uh, custom resources, but also it needs to be aware what kind of services are in the cluster and what, what pods and, and other workloads. Um, but in case this data plane cluster is also managed, for example, uh, in, as in an as a service fashion in a cloud provider's environment, its data plane cluster API may be also outside uh, of the of the cluster itself. It may be in reality deployed on the control plane cluster in the same control plane cluster as is TOD, or it may be anywhere else, basically. Um, so the next thing to make sure is that um, Istio can correctly access that cluster API, which belongs to the data plane cluster, wherever it is. It may, uh, so this, this challenge may consist some cluster credential management, you know, renewing, um, Cube configs, uh, tokens, whatever, and it may also involve some uh, firewall or network management uh, tasks because most probably in many uh, public cloud providers environment, the cluster API access is restricted and it is uh, it is actually required by the user sometimes. Okay, that's fine, um, but. What if the data plane cluster API wants to access its TOD itself? And this is about <clears throat> the sidecar, sidecar injection, for example. Um, so this is a picture about the life of an API request. Um, if you ever imagine what how sidecar inject so how sidecar injecting is happening, then it is about when anyone uh, wants to create a pod. For example, you as the as the end user or your deployment or daemon set controller, it basically goes through a long chain of uh, events. So after some authentication and authorization, it comes to the mutating admission, which means if your data plane cluster API is properly configured for Istio, it wants to call out as an HTTP client to an external service maybe internal, maybe external. In case of the external uh, deployment of ISTOD, it wants to call out externally to it, to the ISTOD uh, service, which is the mutating webhook service. Um, and then it will take care about the uh, sidecar injection. Um, after that, there comes some uh, schema validation after the uh, object is final, and then yet another uh, admission step, it is the validating admission when um, a configured webhook can basically validate and send back a Boolean answer like true or false, whether this API request can go through. And then at the end, it is finally persisted to ETCD. And so whoever is watching uh, that resource will be notified uh, about something is changed in the API server. Um, so that explains the next arrow which is pointing from the data plane cluster API towards back to its TOD, which is another service. It's, it is a completely different service than where Envoy is connecting to. Uh, so Envoy is connecting to the discovery interface of its TOD while, um, while the data plane cluster API is connecting to the webhook service. Um, and that means you have to actually expose multiple services from now on, and you have to take care how you do that. So you, for example, you may want to expose them on different TCP ports. Maybe you want to do it with the SNI header, uh, with multiple host names. Um, and of course, you always have to take care about the certificate management still. Um, okay, uh, so that basically covers the basic mesh management. Now, you are able to create pods. The pods are able to uh, consume config from its TOD. Um, now let's manage the whole thing um, in the next step on a higher level. Um, OK, so we need something to deploy its TOD and gateways and webhooks and, and everything, um, but now in two different clusters. So. Um, on the control plane, 
we should have some kind of operator. Upstream is TOD provides um, its operator. If you are using Red Hat Service Mesh, it provides its yet another uh, Istio operator, which is able to, to install the Mesh components. Um, but now the extra challenge is, um, is that you have to deploy stuff in two different uh, clusters. And if you are using uh, a Kubernetes operator, it is basically by concept only wants to manage a single cluster where it is deployed. Now, since we don't want to deploy anything to the data plane cluster, because we don't want to run there anything, we want to deploy the data plane related operator as well on the control plane side, which is tricky because you have to trick the operator to think it is running on the data plane cluster, which is which can be tricky. So you have to provide your cube config to it for the data plane cluster. You have to make sure that leader election don't don't want to use like pod metadata because the data, because the operator itself is not running in the cluster, which is able to consume in terms of Kubernetes API and so on. Um, but it is possible. So you can trick basically any operator uh, to operate a remote cluster which is fine. So the operator is now connected to the same remote cluster as is TOD. Um, but it turns out in some cases, for example, if you are using Red Hat Service Mesh, um, uh, which is an Istio distribution from Red Hat, their operator is also providing uh, some webhook config, some, so some webhook services. So when you want to reconfigure the mesh itself, for example, I don't know, make MTLS uh, strict or, or, or uh, tweak gateways or something, uh, it really, the operator will be the one which is, uh, uh, which is making it, it happen. And so it wants to validate your, your configuration attempts. Um, and that brings us to the third thing which we want to expose on the control plane, which is the data plane operator. Um, okay. We also want to manage somehow the STOD itself, uh, which will be another instance of the uh, STO operator. Now this is not that complicated because it is running in the same cluster where it wants to operate stuff, uh, which is the control plane cluster. Of course, you need to take care that they are running always at the same version and so on, but it is pretty business as usual for the control plane STO operator. You just have to instruct it to deploy only STOD and for example, no gateways for his TOD in that cluster. Um, okay, I think lifecycle management is complete, at least for the basics. Now we may want to add some cool extra um, to, this, to this mesh service. Okay, so the next thing after you have a, a working mesh is probably some observability. Like you, you want to uh, make sure everything is correctly configured. Your gateways are handling traffic correctly, and so on. So you want to, so you want to do some uh, observation about the mesh, and how it is usually done is via Prometheus. So all the all the um, proxies are exposing Prometheus uh, metrics, which you would be able to easily collect, but only when your Prometheus is also running in the data plane cluster. But our, princ our principle says we should not run anything uh, on the data plane clusters other than the uh, service proxies. Um, so it turns out Envoy offers another kind of metrics exposure, which is kind of the other way around. So proxies will call out actively to an external service uh, with a special gRPC implementation, and it will tell its uh, up-to-date metrics to, to that service, uh, which is cool because we can run that one uh, on the control plane. So it is possible to implement a gRPC kind of sync uh, to collect all these metrics uh, through the proper uh, mesh and sidecar configuration, you are able to tell the envoys that they should use this gRPC endpoint to push metrics to. And then the same collector um, is able to, to expose uh, the Prometheus kind of metrics after some transformation. Um, and why Prometheus is so important? 
because the famous component for mesh visualization, Kiali is able to consume uh, Prometheus metrics. Um, so once once they are available, you can run uh, Kiali also on the control plane cluster to collect those uh, to collect those metrics. Okay, uh, we have working uh, observability. And of course, Kiali. You, so you want to call. Uh, so you want to connect uh, Kiali uh, also to the remote or data plane uh, cluster, uh, because Kiali uh, is making its graphs uh, based on the data plane cluster API. So like your, the workload you are uh, you are deployed and so on. So it it has nothing to do with the control plane cluster, and actually that's what uh, Tom will uh, describe later on about the challenges with uh, with Kiali. Okay, so we have the mesh administrator here, um, which so who naturally wants to access Kiali, um, which means you have to expose Kiali on the same uh, ingress and routing uh, solution where you already exposed for other things. Um, and that brings us to the uh, latest challenge because uh, eventually it will come to some troubleshooting. So. The Istio uh, CLI has a lot of commands to, to troubleshoot your mesh. It is uh, part of the daily mesh operation sometimes uh, to figure out what is uh, probably not going well. Um, Istio CLI has its own tricks to uh, fetch data from Istio-D when Istio-D is running in the mesh cluster. While if Istio-D is exposed only um, through some uh, ingress solution and not uh, not accessible via like uh, a, a Kubernetes cluster access, um, it is getting hard, especially when you run multiple instances of Istio. This for so, for example, um, you can easily uh, scale Istio D uh, like with multiple replicas where they will be all active, and probably only one of them uh, is broken. So uh, that is not possible basically to reach out to any particular instance of Istio-D if you use a generic uh, ingress solution. And actually that was identified by the, by the Istio community and they offered uh, a great proxy, uh, which is able to collect data from all the Istio instances on behalf of the, uh, of the Istio CLI, which means you have to expose yet another thing, this proxy, uh, to the user so that the user can configure its Istio CLI uh, to the proxy endpoint um, instead, of, uh, instead of the individual uh, Istio D. Okay, and that's more or less it, basically. So we have working mesh with working observability. Everything is correctly exposed. Um, the last challenge is to actually uh, implement something which makes this uh, all real. So on top of on top of this uh, many components, you naturally need some kind of other higher level operator or some other automations, uh, which is uh, which is basically reacting to the user request because the user naturally won't have any access on Kubernetes level to the control plane cluster. So you as the service provider needs to uh, needs to operate everything um, on the control plane. So one one example scenario is to implement an operator on top of everything which is which is running also on the control plane and it is um, uh, instructed by some public API or whatever where the user can um, can uh, trigger installations or upgrades or or whatever else uh, for mesh operation. And if you have such an such an automation, you can do you can easily do a multi-tenant control plane, where the same control plane cluster can serve uh, many uh, many different meshes with many different uh, customers potentially. Um, so this control plane cluster can be multi-tenant easily if you uh, if you do it in the right way. Uh, but that but that's up to the uh, provider, of course, and. I think I hand over to Tong to explain the Kiali challenges uh, he faced with recently. So Tong, over to you. Right, great. Thanks, Kirgo. Um, right, uh, when you 
uh, use the external control plane, the benefit is obvious, right? You, you want your control plane running in a different cluster and your workloads running, just you know, probably most likely the custom clusters. And they should have the full control of that. And the, the, the cloud providers or the service providers have the control uh, of the full control of the uh, control plan of ISTU. Um, so this clear separation, it's it's good for everybody, right? Uh, each one's, each party's responsibility is clear. But as he has indicated, now you, uh, when you're trying to manage those things, uh, you know, uh, you face some challenges. Kelly is one of the component that actually is, uh, it's, it's great to allow you to see what's happening uh, on your mesh, um, where the service is, how service communicate with each other. And it's a really great tool. Uh, but the, the issue is that uh, Kali can be, I'm talking just one instance of a Kali, can be configured just to uh, work with basically one set of credentials uh, to access ISTUD or manage the uh, namespaces that your workload is running in. Uh, so the assumption that they made is that uh, your ISTUD and the workload running in the same cluster. So they have one set of the credentials to use for both purposes. This is a problem if you have multiple class clusters involved, right? Your external control plan running in one cluster, your workflow, uh, your workload running in, in the other, right? So um, currently you just cannot say, okay, uh, I just want to configure one, uh, I still, uh, a Kali instance to do both, right? It will not work. So the workaround uh, is, you know, you, you can have multiple Kali instances, right? Uh, one configured to hit your control, uh, external control plan, which ICD is running in. And the other instance is configured to hit your uh, workload clusters. So you see all the namespaces and the traffic flows, everything there. Of course, this is not ideal. Uh, you have multiple instances for Kali to, to, to work with, right? You have to manage them. Um, but I'm hoping that uh, the, in the future, Kali uh, community can, can uh, add the, the features that uh, they will be just uh, get all the information that can workload information uh, through the metrics, right? Then you can have your Prometheus uh, aggregated, uh, regardless how many workload clusters you may have, you can have two, three, or even more, but all the metrics that uh, um, are showing the traffic uh, can be aggregated into one instance of uh, Prometheus. Then the Prometheus work with uh, Kiali to, to not only manage your ISDLD, but also the uh, uh, the workload traffic, right? Um, so currently there's there's a feature request to open and hopefully this can be made uh, available soon. All right, I think that's one thing I wanted to add. 